So hello, everybody, and welcome. Uh, you are all here for the taking aim at racial and language bias in AI models. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Shingai Manjengwa, and I'm going to give you the rundown of a program that we did at the Vector Institute. And then you're actually going to hear from our tutors, and you're going to hear from some people who participated in the program. And we really just want to share with you what worked and hopefully what you can replicate in your own organizations to reduce bias. I've got David here, and I think David was going to say a few words, but then I started talking. So <laughs> hi, Dave. Hey. I'm very, very grateful. I just want to say thank you for joining. And thanks, everybody here for joining for the uh, yeah, for the session. And thank you so much, Shingai. Um, I wanted to give you a quick intro. Um, we're actually, we have more people joining this session. So it's, that's very exciting. I won't intro them all here at the moment. So we'll let them stream in and we will be adding them as we go. But first of all, I did want to introduce Shingai, who is the Director of Professional Development and Technical Education at the Vector Institute for Artificial Intelligence in Toronto, Canada. So at the Vector Institute, Shingai translates advanced AI research into educational programming to drive AI adoption for one and innovation for two in industry. So Shingai serves as the Ad advisory council for accelerating the AI adoption in healthcare, amongst other things. But that is a program to empower frontline healthcare workers with AI skills by the Missioner Institute of Education at United Health Network and the Vector Institute. Shingai also serves on the board of the Canadian Institute on Governance, IOG. She holds a master's degree in business analytics from New York University Stern School of Business. And she has a children's book, The Computer and the Cancelled Music Lessons, which teaches data science to kids from ages five to 12. I have it, it's a great book. I recommend you get that <laughs> on Amazon as well. My daughter will be reading that, I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> she guys also, um, the 2020 recipient of the Public Policy Forum Emerging Leader Awards. So um, a, a big introduction. Um, Shinga has a lot to share. I hope you really enjoy that. You can find her on LinkedIn and Twitter. I'll drop that here in the chat. Um, and there's some other introductions that we'll get to as we, we go along. So just a quick housekeeping note for those who are joining the conference sessions, the conference uh, main session that starts tomorrow and Thursday. Check your email. You have a link from Hopin, which will allow you to get on the platform. Shingai will also be giving a keynote at that session, which is a bit of a, a follow-up to this. Um, and we'll touch on some of the points here today. But with that being said, I will introduce Shingai and company. So thank you, everybody. I hope you enjoy. Thanks, Dave. All righty. So welcome once again. Um, my name is Shingai, and I'm here to talk to you about uh, taking aim at uh, racial and language model bias. So I'm going to tell you the story of how this program started, and then um, you'll hear more about it in the keynote. If you attend the keynote, that's going to be the really great summary. And we also have someone from the National Research Council of Canada attending that as well. Um, so you'll get a really great summary of the program itself. But what we're here today is, is more of a workshop. So we're, we are going to get into some of the details. I see Fatima is here. Um, she was one of the tutors in the program, and she's going to take us through um, her section, essentially. She was doing the uh, bias and language models. Um, it's somewhat what technical let's get involved folks uh, there's a chat function that's open to you so if you've got questions drop it in there i'm going to be your moderator and uh, first and foremost let me just tell you a bit about the program itself uh, so uh, i'm sharing my screen and uh, i've got up the program summary so uh, last year uh, we got uh, contacted by the National Research Council of Canada. There were a number of conversations ahead of that. And it all culminated in, hey, Vector Institute, can you develop something to talk about bias? So the National Research Council of Canada is responsible for um, really investing and developing uh, small to medium enterprises and entrepreneurship in Canada. And in their role, they work with uh, lots of SMEs, so that's small to medium enterprises. And this was identified as a need um, to have this important conversation about bias in, in AI. So we have these SMEs that are developing uh, AI tech and building models and deploying them. And this was identified as a really important point that, hey, can we just actually make sure that these organizations are aware of what can go wrong and can do their best to mitigate it. So we developed this program. 
from scratch. Um, that's what I do for a living is I make programs up uh, when people tell me the topic that they want to learn. And um, then I pull in the, the right and the smart people who can teach the program. So this particular one was run in the month of February. It was five weeks long. Um, we had two touch points uh, every two uh, for two hours uh, every week. One was a lecture session that was um, uh, delivered by Syed Najadi, who was our key instructor. Um, he is a part of the Vector Institute research community. And then we had one tutorial a week, and we also had guest lectures and industry lectures from uh, different partners. So um, you'll meet the two tutors today. Um, Fatima is already uh, ready to go. And actually, she's got more interesting stuff to tell you. So I'll, I'll run through the program quite quickly. So that was really uh, the, the program itself. I'll tell you what we actually covered in each of the weeks, just in case you want to be able to replicate this for yourselves or think about the content that we covered. In the first week, we started with uh, what we call Python hygiene or AI hygiene, and that's to make sure that everybody's just on the same page, right? We all come from different academic backgrounds, we have different technical experience, etc. So when we pulled in these uh, 10 SMEs, um, about 30-ish people, and we also had a few Vector staff member and researchers and community members auditing the course, so it was about 30 people in total. Um, when we pull in all those different people, we have to have some sort of level set, hey, this is, this is our best practice for how we run programs, um, uh, how we run models, etc. So that was week one was really just an orientation. But as early as week one, we had already uh, uh, had a hands on assignment and that hands on assignment was um, a text analytics uh, or uh, text model. Um, and Fatima will tell you more about that. And then in week two, that's when we started the fundamentals of uh, computer vision. And obviously, when, we, when it comes to bias, computer vision is the big area of focus because it is uh, notorious for getting, getting it wrong. Models are notorious for getting things wrong with skin tones like mine, um, not identifying uh, skin tones, lots of false positives with my skin tone, etc. So that's really something we want, wanted to get into the meat of. So we covered the theory components of NLP, and then we covered the theory components of computer vision. And at the end of each of those weeks, we had an assignment. So folks could really get their hands dirty. Um, it's one thing to say we want to learn bias, but you have to apply that to some uh, domain and to some area so that you can actually mitigate it. Um, when we got to week three, we covered governance, privacy, and ethics, and for obvious reasons. Um, but really, this is re uh, more about how do you run data in your organization, right? So if we're at some point going to have a conversation about bias can occur through your data sets, then we need to have a conversation about how do you govern your data sets and your organization. This piece was so well received. I mean, it's an assignment, so there was a little bit of complaining, uh, but it was so well received that, um, you know, one of the SMEs said to us, now when we get new hires, we just give them that assignment and tell them to read it. Because, you know, if an organization didn't have any kind of governance framework or documentation, um, this assignment really afforded them the opportunity to, do, to create that. And then in week four, we started tackling how to reduce the bias. So, you know, we've talked about bias occurring and we talked around it. We gave the fundamentals of NLP and computer vision, but this is now getting into the meat of, okay, so say you've identified bias in your models, then what? So we had a fantastic session by Elliot Krieger, who's one of the vector researchers who specializes in the area of fairness. Um, Elliot wasn't able to join us today, unfortunately, um, but Elliot's session was really incredible and um, he covered the mathematics of bias. So he covered how do you quantify bias mathematically and then how do you then mitigate bias mathematically, so some statistical methods to be able to address that. And then uh, as we were wrapping up, we the whole program culminated in what we call a capstone project. Now, capstone projects are a hallmark feature of all vector programming in that you have to produce something at the end of your education, right? So it's not enough to just say, I took this course, I took some online course and it was nice. You actually have to produce something. So our capstones were for the SMEs to now say, what did they learn in our program and how did they apply it to their own organizations? So that's what the capstone project was. And we're pretty strict about it. It's delivered in latex. So it looks like an academic paper and we insist on that and people complain, but we insist on that um, because it's all part of the process to get folks to really apply 
their learnings in a formalized way. And those papers can be used uh, and passed down within the organization. They can be shared um, and they can be reviewed as uh, uh, almost academic papers. So that's just an overview of how the program was run and what we were trying to achieve with it. And um, I'm now going to hand over to uh, Fatima, who's going to give us uh, the first tutorial um, that we covered in the natural language processing component. All right, so Fatima, over to you. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining this presentation. My name is Fatima. Uh, I'm a new grad at U of T. Um, I'm currently working as a data scientist at TD Securities. Um, and before I start, I'd just like to share a survey with you guys on ML toolings. Uh, if you guys are using any ML tools in the industry, or if you would like to get familiar with the tools, uh, please fill in my survey. Um, and then without any further ado, uh, let me share my screen. Um, if, if the host can let me share my screen, it would be great. Please try again. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so this is what I covered in the, the first tutorial of, of the course. And uh, I mostly covered only uh, bias in NLP. Um, so let's talk about the history of uh, bias uh, in, in machine learning. So up until 2015, uh, machine learning was thought to be bias-free. Um, in fact, in, in 2015, uh, there was a piece released by New York Times um, suggesting that uh, all recruiting process uh, sh processes should be uh, should be moved 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 over to machines because machines are uh, are not uh, biased like humans, and they were contacted by a lot of researchers back then. Uh, so they published another piece just two weeks later, uh, saying that uh, <clears throat> um, machines are not um, fair, and in fact they, they reinforce human prejudices as well. Um, so this is a history of research, uh, the amount of research being done uh, in fairness, uh, in of fairness in machine learning. So before 2015, uh, nobody was taking fairness uh, in ML seriously. But then starting from 2015, um, a lot of researchers have been at, uh, paying more attention to fairness. Um, so but, but why does it matter? Why, why do we care if machines are fair or not? Uh, we care because a lot of the tools that we, we interact with in a daily basis um, are automated now. Um, so for example, employers now use automated systems to select, select job applicants. <laughs> and it gets, and it's even more serious than that. Uh, there, there are courts in the US that use algorithms um, for recidivism prediction. And then we've all had interaction with recommender systems, chatbots, and uh, AI is now being used in healthcare to, uh, for prediction and survivor analysis. Um, there are mul multiple reasons uh, why machines learn to discriminate. Uh, uh, one reason is that our samples are skewed. So there is an initial bias in the sample and it remains there and gets compounded. Um, another reason is that once our machine learns the bias in our data, it keeps it. Um, and it, it never, it never learn, learn, learns to be uh, fair again. Um, another reason why uh, our machines Maybe, uh, maybe unfair is because we have limited features for minority groups. Um, so if you want to collect a data set, you usually end up having less features um, and less data points for minority groups compared to majority groups. Um, and that causes your model to be uh, a better predictor for majority groups than minority groups. Also, if you try to um, manually um, exclude sensitive attributes, uh, there may still remain some proxies of your sensitive attribute in your data. 
Um, so now let's look at some of the examples of bias in NLP. The very uh, famous one was found in word embeddings. Um, so the, the goal here is to, uh, for, for a language model to solve an analogy puzzle. An analogy puzzle is, uh, it goes like man is to blank as woman is to blank. And what model uh, predicted here was man is to computer programmer as woman is to homemaker. And that uh, really caused concerns back in 2016 because anyone who looks at this sentence can tell that it's um, biased. So they looked at uh, a lot of more examples and they found out that this model called word to vec which was trained on Google News, was actually uh, truly, uh, was truly exhibiting female versus male gender stereotypes. Um, so for example, for she occupations, it would output nurse, homemaker, nanny, housekeeper. And then for he occupations, it would output uh, magician, warrior, captain, boss, and things like that. Um, we could even go beyond gender and look at some of the some of the biases that were found in word embeddings with regards to racial and religious analogies. Um, so one very famous example that was outputted by the model was black is to criminal as Caucasian is to to police. And then they look at all other analogies, uh, and then they found out very. Um, they found out that uh, the, a, a language model that was trained on Reddit data would show all sorts of uh, biases. Um, another example of bias in NLP is is some is, is a is a method called coref. It's another area in NLP that showed obvious bias was called uh, co-reference analysis. Um, so this is a co-reference analysis tool by a Stanford called Core NLP, and it was analyzed in 2018. Uh, and and it, it showed obvious bias towards uh, male and female. So for example, and, and the goal here is to be, is to, here is to go over a sentence and then whenever we get to a pronoun, we try to find the co-reference of this pronoun. So, so the mo model was uh, successfully able to co-reference, in the first sentence, it was able to successfully co-reference his to the surgeon, uh, whereas, it, whereas in the last sentence, it failed to co-reference her to the surgeon. Um, another um, task in NLP that has shown um, bias is something called text generation. Um, and you can see uh, the results of a very commonly used model called GPT-2. Um, so when, when given uh, female versus male uh, pronouns it, it, and words, it, it generates biased outputs. Some of the examples generated by models are so offensive that uh, in every paper, nowadays in every paper on uh, fairness and bias in NLP, they have a dis disclaimer saying that um, you will see offensive examples in this paper. Um, and not very long ago, in 2020, uh, GPT-3 model was released and then uh, people um, try to generate um, tweets uh, by give by prompting the model with only one word. And we can see that um, people were, were very surprised by, by the, the text generated uh, from, from, from the words give, from the, these words given to the model. So Jews, black and women. Um, this is not something new. In fact, Microsoft released a Twitter bot in 2016 called Tay. And then uh, Tay tried to learn uh, how to respond to tweets by interacting with real 
uh, people on Twitter. And just after 24 hours of interaction with real humans, um, they generated, generated this tweet. Um, so Microsoft tried to fix Tay and, and released a moderated version of it called Zoe in 2017. Um, and the model, uh, and the, the, uh, the chatbot was modeled not to discuss any politics and religion. Uh, and then it had to avoid engaging in racial and inappropriate conversation. But one thing that Zoe really missed was, was, try, was identify between uh, inappropriate conversation and just normal conversation about uh, a topic, say, Middle East. And that just shows us how hard it is for, for a machine to identify bias in text. Um, so now let's look at some of the ways we can measure bias in text. Um, so this was this this method called wheat word embedding association test uh, was uh, was suggested by Princeton University in 2016, uh, which is uh, consider two sets of target words, say programmer, engineer, scientist, and then nurse, teacher, librarian, and then two sets of attribute words such as man, male, and then women, woman, female. The null hypothesis here is that uh, there should be no difference between the two sets of target words in terms of their, their similarity to the sets of attribute words. So the relationship between programmer and man should be exactly the same as programmer uh, to woman. And then by computing the probability of random permutation of the words. Uh, so, so changing man to woman and, and computing the probability of programming showing up, uh, we can measure the, the likelihood or unlikelihood of the null hypothesis. Another way to detect bias uh, in text uh, was, was introduced in 2019, uh, and it was using a sentiment classifier. Um, and the idea here is that um, if we, and then X, Y, Z here in these examples, they represent demographic, a, a demographic group. So changing X, Y, Z, if, if, if the sentence is not biased, changing the demographic group should not change the sentiment of the uh, sentence. Uh, and then here we can see that uh, the first two sentences are marked, are regarded biased because changing the demographic groups uh, does change the sentiment. Um, another popular method which, which was introduced uh, very recently is called build it, break it, fix it. Um, so the, the idea here is to um, iteratively build a model that can identify uh, bias. Uh, so initially, you, you want to train your classifier on a, on, on a toxic comments data. And then you want to recruit people and ask them to try and beat the system by, um, by presenting it with messages that uh, are not explicitly toxic, but are toxic uh, in nature. Uh, and then, and then these messages will, 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 and then the model, the initial model will fail to identify uh, the bias in, in, uh, in new messages. So, so what you do is you train another model on collected on, on these collected examples and you repeat these steps until you're happy with the result of your or the accuracy of your classifier. Um, so why do you think it's hard to identify for, for a machine to identify um, bias in, in text? Because because you can't just um, count the uh, occurrence of pairs of words in a sentence and then um, decide whether it's, it's, it's neutral or not. But it, it doesn't work like that because um, 
because uh, the, occur the, the, the occurring of pairs of words are not, um, are not exactly the same for, for, for some of the words. For example, um, male nurse shows up more frequently than, than female nurse in, a, in, in, a, in, in, in text. And that's because usually uh, nurses are regarded to be female. Language is also very messy. Uh, one word can, can mean different things depending on context. Um, so context also really matters. Um, now let's look at the um, assignment we had participants complete. Um, basically, we wanted them to to learn how to uh, create uh, a language model that can uh, generate text and work as a uh, chat box and then interact with it and then be able to analytically and systematically identify bias in generated text. Um, so we asked them to work with GPT model, uh, which stands for Generative Pre-trained Transformer. And GPT is really good because it is pre-trained on unlabeled text which, is, which, which everyone has access to. Uh, and then it is uh, fine-tuned on, on a smaller uh, labeled data set for a specific task. Um, GPT itself is task agnostic. Uh, and then when it was released, it improved upon the state of the art in, <coughs> excuse me, nine out of the 12 different NLP tasks. Um, so we asked the participants to fine tune their chatbot on Twitter chat dataset, uh, which is public and contains a set of tweets and responses from real people. And uh, almost, all, uh, almost every time you work with um, conversations from real people, you usually have uh, bias in your dataset. Uh, and then we asked them to, to to identify whether their model is um, biased or not. So here are some of the examples that my mo the, the model I trained generated for me. So when I commented, when I commented he's going to be a great doctor, the model re response was something very neutral. So I can't get my hair to look good for another week. And, and these responses, by the way, are not perfect because um, we didn't train on a very big data set and we didn't train for a long time for a lot of iterations uh, and then when i commented she is going to be a great doctor the model's response was very negative so it said this makes me sad that she is so much more than a wife and you can analytically just see bias in, in the response of the model um, we also uh, recommended our participants to to um, systematically identify bias. One way we uh, suggested they do this is was by using Affin score. Um, so what Affin score is is that it uh, assigns a send positive or negative sentiment to every English word, and then by averaging the scores of all the words in your sentence, you can uh, you can. Um, have a sense of um, whether your sentence is, has positive sentiment or negative sentiment. And then second way we add the second way we asked them to uh, analyze their, the mo their model responses was to use um, this, the library car parlay. Um, this is Facebook AI's uh, open source NLP platform. And it's really cool because it gives you access to all the popular data sets out there and a wide set of reference models. Um, it also provides a classifier for you to detect bias. Um, but the, the accuracy of the classifier is, is not very good. So, so the, the problem still remains there. Um, with that, um, these are the resources. Some, if, if you, you would like to learn more about uh, fairness and machine learning, uh, these are some of the good resources that are out there. And then with that, I can give it back to Shingai. Thank you so much, Fatima. That's uh, fantastic. All right, folks. So 
this is a, a, an, an unusual uh, opportunity to ask Fatima questions uh, about the work that we were doing. So um, please uh, take advantage of it. Uh, anybody who wants to get, uh, who has questions. So just on the subject of that language model, I uh, tried it myself. And if you put in like directly provocative uh, terms, like if you put in black people, for example, then the text that came back was you know, a lot to do with policing and um, suspended police and just a lot to do with policing. Um, and if you did the same thing for white people, which I was doing deliberately to see what the model would produce, then it was really, um, you know, general uh, material. So um, it's, we didn't set out to create a racist model, but just by virtue of the pre-training process, that's what we got. So Ushnish, I've got your hand up. Do you wanna just maybe unmute yourself and ask the question? Um, sure. Um, so a lot of people are using GPT-3 and, and as a service. Um, they're not developing NLP models from scratch. And I'm wondering um, how you think of the organizations and projects using these applications as services, but not necessarily understanding the biases that are embedded in those services when they haven't built it themselves or from scratch. Fatima, do you want to uh, take us uh, start with the answer there? Um, yes. Uh, so if I understand the question correctly, is how do you know if a model that is if a, if an API that you use is biased or not, right? Um, usually, um, if you use a model, you you want to fine tune it on a smaller data set that is useful for you uh, for a specific task that you have in mind. Um, so you, you have to make sure that that smaller data set is not biased. And, um, and if these models come from big companies such as Facebook and Google, usually they try to train on, on uh, unbiased data, but at the end of the day, it can be biased. And um, as I said, there is no certain way of measuring, uh, of classifying whether a model is biased or not. Thanks. And uh, one of the that's why we're doing a program like this, and we're going to be running it again. Um, the NRC has confirmed that they're very interested in doing it again because it was so well received. That's what we our contribution can be to make sure that we're running training programs like this to raise the awareness. I've got Tristan Falk from South Africa. Hi, Tristan. Hi, Shingai. Uh, thanks so much. Great seeing you. Um, thank you, Patima, for that talk. I was hoping I could please ask um, regarding drawing the line between bias and statistical inference. I was thinking, for example, about the, um, the nurse situation that you mentioned, Fatima. So by my understanding, there are many, many, many more female nurses than male nurses, which is not to say that a nurse has to be female, but where do we draw the line between the machine just realizing that, that a nurse is much, much, much more likely to be female um, and it being specifically biased as opposed to statistical inference? Um, the way humans usually think of nurse is itself bias, of nurses is itself biased because when you hear the word nurse, you most of the time think of a female nurse. And we see that in in uh, in models as well, and I guess it it really depends on whether you want to see those statistical inferences in the output of your model, or you don't want to see them. Like if it's okay with you to 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 have the bias, the human bias in the output of your model, then then it's okay for the model to have it. If not, then you have to find a way to um, de-bias your model. Yeah, we're calling these automated decision systems, right? And so let's also not think about it in the micro instance where we're doing this in an academic setting. At the end of the day, we want to deploy this stuff in industry and in the world. So if we don't account for the bias, like in the Amazon example, where they trained a model based on their best employees, and it turned out that those employees were all men, if 
we don't account for the bias, then we just automate that into the world and in ways that may become invisible down the line. So it's part of that human machine interaction where we do have to look at it and have that objective uh, perspective that we would rather not have bias in our data sets. So we have to have the intervention. And in some cases, we will need to be the, the human needs to facilitate that. It's not necessarily going to come out in the data set because the data set in itself is reflective of what's happened already. The data set is learning from the past, which may be a racist past. Uh, Ron. Hi, Ron. I can't hear you. Ron, while you're working on that, I've got another question in the chat, which says, uh, did we look at, uh, did we just look at NLP? Um, did we consider people with disabilities? And the short answer to that is we did the two examples that we did with the natural language processing and the um, computer vision were not targeted at uh, groups with disabilities. And that is just the finite amount of time that we had, but absolutely we should be looking at that. And um, the conversation is open to anybody here. You know, if you're doing that type of work and you've got an interesting case study to share, we would absolutely love to hear from you because it's going to take all of us to identify biases in different settings, to write papers about them, to raise awareness about them. And at conferences like this, potentially even get a slot to discuss it. So, um, you know, hats off to MLOps for creating the space to discuss it. And if you've done that work and you're looking for a place to highlight it, please reach out to the conference organizers or even myself on LinkedIn and happy to create platforms to discuss that. Um, Ron, do you wanna try again? Sure, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Great. Um, so uh, thanks, Fatima, for uh, the talk. So my question is about like, these are good examples in the NLP and image processing space. Um, are there like good resources for looking for bias in kind of tabular tabular data sets, which is very common, you know, common inputs for a lot of business use cases and detecting bias in those areas? Um, I have worked with uh, tabular data that has a tabular data that has bias in it uh, in healthcare. Mm -hmm. So so some some races are just not represented well in healthcare data sets. And then usually um, number of males and females are different. What we want in, in tabular healthcare data is um, the exact same number of um, data points for, for each group. Um, so we also we always have to watch out for bias in terms of um, race and sex. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think that's a good example. I'm also interested in like techniques on tabular data for detecting or handling these situations. Uh, what we usually do is we calculate accuracy and um, recall on for for each subgroup, and then try to see if. The, that score matches the uh, is, is similar between groups. If if it is, then it means we have good number of representatives from each group. Oh, okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, Elise. Okay. Um. So, uh, my question is more. Um, so, how do you propose that um, you, we would go about um, in putting in these checks for the biases? When, um, like for example, in tech, the um, the employee base tends to be quite skewed. So um, um, Fatima mentioned how you know, like um, I think Google or Amazon put forward their best employees, and their best employees are all men. Um, and you know, we know in tech that there's an issue with bias around race and gender generally. So if these are the people who are going to be kind of policing the model how do we ensure that they can do so? Um, so one way is to exclude um, those attributes that we think um, may, may cause bias, but it's not, it's not always easy to do that because um, for example, if you have a data set of people with their postal codes and their income level, and then you, uh, identify that, oh, income level may be uh, something that may cause bias in, in your model, and you exclude those, postal code still can be a proxy of income level. And your model is really smart in picking up uh, that bias. 
Um, so yeah, yeah. You answered me very, um, very um, uh, literally, which is, which is good. Uh, but I think, for example, the question that was asked earlier around nurses is kind of indicative of it. So, so I understood the question to be more like saying, well, the reality is there are more female nurses than male nurses. And then um, your response was that, yeah, but it is also a stereotype to think about a nurse as being a woman. And I would say those things are actually not disconnected because it's sort of like perhaps they're more nurses because there are stereotypes around that that influence mm -hmm. people's choices and and agency and all of that right but but um so from some people's perspective if you're working in the field you would be thinking well this is simply representing the reality but then when we do di work you kind of want to go beyond just what the reality is in many cases because the reality is a function of the racism and the sexism and all of that so I, I guess like the way you answered is really great, but a lot of the cases are a lot more nuanced than that. And I'm wondering how we, how we get to that. So Elise, your question is a big question, um, granted. So um, uh, I think Fatima's approach, which is very much, yeah, it's the literal approach. That's what we would do actively when we're dealing with the models, but it sounds like you're asking a system question. And so uh, if I can just give the example of the um, uh, AI and healthcare program that we're building through the Michigan Institute and Vector Institute, those kinds of programs, me sitting on the program development committee is very much part of making sure that we've, we've got that baked into the curriculum. Um, so, you know, one of my key takeaways always is diversity as a risk mitigation strategy. Um, so having somebody on the team who can put up their hand and say, hey, have we considered X, Y, Z? But to your point, if uh, the, the decision makers in an organization just you know, that those power structures are partly responsible for the bias in the system, um, then, you know, th that's a much bigger conversation that uh, we, we may not solve here and now. But I take your point and it's, it's very much part of the conversation that and why we need to be having it. So thank you very much. Um, folks, I'm going to need to move on to our next tutor soon. Um, I'll just take one more question. Um, Aaron says, how do we deal with bias for companies that don't collect information on gender, race, or ability? We don't have a way to check that our users are being treated equally. Um, so actually, there's mathematical methods to do this. Um, I'll hand over to Fatima to just uh, close off this chapter. But certainly, uh, you know, testing your results for bias is one of the simplest methods that you could do. Are you getting more, more false positives for particular groups than others? And then investigating why that, that's the case. But Fatima, I'll hand over to you to maybe address that one. So can bias occur when we don't have um, those markers? And if it does, what can we do to try and mitigate it? Um, so if, if our data does not have an um, attribute that can be biased, is that your question? What can we, do we still expect bias in our model? Yes, that's the question. Um, so yeah, even if we don't have uh, any attributes, any bias attributes, uh, we may still not have good representations of everyone in our data. And in, in the case of healthcare, our model, like if we have more male than female in our data set, the model is not being biased, but it learns to, learns better, uh, learns to, um, detect uh, diseases in male in, in men better than the way it learns to detect diseases in, in women. Um, so we can't uh, go and present our model uh, and then let, let everyone use it and say, oh, the accuracy of our model is 80% because it's not 80% on the entire uh, population. Uh, maybe it's like 60% for, for females and then like 90% for male. And so we always, even if we, we don't really um, have these attributes in our, in our uh, data set, we still have to watch out for them. Always uh, try to divide our data set uh, into groups and then um, calculate accuracy and results of our model for, for each subgroup. 
Thank you. All right, so Fatima, we'll let you go. Um, thank you so much for uh, popping in today and also for the work that you did in the tutorial. It was very well received. Um, all the different teams that ran that language model got the shock of their lives um, because you know most people said, uh, hey, I'm a good person. There's no way my model could be racist. And then they did the exercise and uh, they, they got the shock of their lives. So thank you so much for all your hard work on this topic. It's much appreciated. Thank you. All right, folks. So um, the next uh, uh, person we're going to hear from is another tutor who is in the program. So Rashav, I think you're here. Uh, Rashav, I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself and come onto camera. Uh, there you are. Hi, Hello. Rashav. All right. So I'm going to give you uh, the ability to share. I think you might have some slides. All right, so um, uh, just by way of introduction, maybe you can tell us uh, who you are, what you're studying, what's your area of specialization, uh, and then you can get into your section on computer vision. Uh, sure, can everybody hear me? We can hear you, yeah. Okay. Hi guys, uh, my name is Risha Vagarwal. I'm, uh, I'm a recent graduate from the University of Waterloo. Uh, I did my master's in computer, uh, in computer science with a thesis in computer vision. Currently, I'm working at Akasha Imaging. Uh, we do auto uh, industrial automation, and my area of focus is mostly uh, building computer vision models that go onto cameras and then into robots. Uh, so that's sort of where I am coming from. Uh, I participated in this uh, workshop that happened back uh, uh, back in February, uh, and I was one of the tutors. And uh, my uh, the stuff I talked about then was basically computer vision and then how uh, bias uh, creeps into computer vision and what we can do about it. So uh, that's what I will talk about today as well. Uh, I'm basically using all of my slides from that talk. I did not prepare new slides for this. Uh, so I hope uh, you guys are excited about this. Uh, oh, and forgot to thank Fatima for that great talk on uh, bias in NLP. Now let's uh, explore bias in computer vision. So, I will share my screen. I think this is, oh, let me quickly present now and then, oops, yeah. And uh, share screen, yep, share. Okay, so here is the, the presentation. Uh, so when we talk about, so everybody in their daily lives have come across uh, computer vision, computer vision algorithms, and they, uh, you sort of know uh, there is a cool computer vision algorithm being used when we talk about things like uh, face detection, or we talk about uh, uh, any, basically anything that involves images, you, uh, we automatically go to some sort of uh, an algorithm trying to make our decisions for us. And then uh, it's typically uh, a deep learning based model. So uh, so I'm not going to talk a lot about uh, bias in terms of uh, uh, classical vision, but more in terms of the modern vision with, with uh, deep learning components. So for example, if we give you for these four images, what does a model see? So, uh, so you may think about uh, gender, you may think about uh, whether they're smiling or not, but actually uh, the the source of this uh, these images is basically sexual orientation. So just if I go back to these images, can you uh, look at these images and make out uh, the sexual orientation of a person just from an image? And uh, modern computer vision uh, and modern research might tell you yes, but not really because for example, uh, if you just look at uh, composite images, uh, so these are composite images. So they take many, many images of people who have self-identified with uh, uh, gender, and then they make a composite out of that. And you see that there is not really much difference between somebody who would identify as male versus, uh, sorry, uh, identify as straight versus say uh, gay. And then uh, still uh, there are papers which try to identify uh, these, uh, these attributes which are inherently uh, you cannot make them out just by looking at somebody's face. Uh, and uh, if humans can do it, can't do it, how can uh, algorithms do it? So that's uh, like some of the questions we should keep in mind when we try to build, build these algorithms. Uh, 
Uh, now, another uh, another uh, uh, paper we uh, looked at is this one. For example, we have these four images. Uh, so, what do you, what does the model see? So, can anybody in the uh, in the audience tell me how diff how are these four uh, images different? Uh, you can unmute and talk uh, if you would like. Oops, sorry. Mm. Anyone? Okay, so basically they're all the same, uh, but uh, what they were trying to do was uh, they were trying to measure attractiveness uh, using a computer vision algorithm. And basically if you give the same photo of uh, uh, different photos of the same person, the model would uh, classify the top ones as attractive, uh, more attractive than the ones below, although they are all the same person. Now these, uh, so again, uh, these are attributes that are human defined. And when we try to force them onto a computer vision model, uh, the computer vision model makes uh, uh, some assumptions and uh, that assumptions are usually influenced by the data. So typically if you give somebody to uh, label these data, data points and they label the top ones as more attractive, then the model will also think, okay, if uh, there are edges like uh, this, if the hair looks like uh, is uh, cleanly parted, then probably uh, this uh, this uh, photo is quote unquote attractive. So, uh, so uh, and there are even deeper biases. So for example, if we look at uh, male versus female accessories, uh, so, if we uh, if we uh, uh, if we go for a popular tool like Microsoft's Azure Cognitive Services, uh, and ask what a mask is, and the attributes that a mask is given when the uh, wearer is men uh, is male is a fashion accessory or beard or identified as a mask, whereas for women it's more likely to be classified as a fashion accessory. So there is an inherent gender bias. So it's not even uh, trying to uh, predict a random attribute. These attributes are. Uh, again, due to the fact that uh, probably in the training data, more and more uh, women images, uh, images of uh, females were marked with fashion accessories than, male, than men. And that's why uh, when the model was trying to predict, uh, it uh, probably thought that if it's a mask, it's probably a fashion accessory rather than, uh, uh, rather than say a mask. Whereas uh, for men, it was more likely to be marked, marked as a beard. And again, this was a more recent paper. And what uh, what the authors did was basically they gave uh, the image a crop of a face, and uh, they were supposed to uh, auto complete the uh, auto complete the rest of the image. And uh, uh, so they they had to pull this this particular image from the paper because there was a lot of backlash. But essentially, what they did was they gave an image of the uh, uh, U.S. senator. Uh, uh, AOC, uh, who is very popular on social media as well. And uh, when they gave it to a model to autocomplete, uh, many of the images were uh, AOC uh, in a bikini clad uh, uh, image. Whereas when they gave a photo of a, uh, of a male participant, uh, they were uh, filled up with uh, 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 work-related attributes like a chef. Uh, for example, these two are chef uh, or a doctor or a scientist. Uh, so they relate more uh, to a career-related attire. Uh, so it's again uh, 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 a function of uh, the deep bias that is there in the data itself. So, so you can see that uh, uh, for females, the uh, the IGPT or the model try to make it uh, more like a, uh, 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 try to attribute it more as models or. Uh, for somebody who would go more into fashion versus uh, for men, it would be more of these uh, professions. And it's not just uh, gender bias. For example, if we look at uh, this uh, particular example, uh, if uh, we uh, look at the left two images, uh, these are both soaps. But uh, if we give uh, the same image to different uh, popular classifiers, like say Google or uh, Watson, Amazon, et cetera, oops. Uh, then uh, you would see that uh, the the soap uh, on the left, which is bars of soap, is uh, often marked with uh, things like cooking, delicious, healthy, whereas uh, or the left one, which shows shows a liquid soap bottle, is marked as uh, more uh, more as healthcare or sanitary. 
And again, uh, if you look at the images on the right, uh, uh, people might store spices or have different kinds of spices in uh, weird bottles. Uh, say uh, in Philippines, uh, this uh, where the average income is about $262. Uh, if you look at uh, these, they are marked as bottle or even beer, whereas uh, the crown truth for spices, if they're marked with uh, these nice little, uh, these little bottles with proper labeling, uh, because you, uh, if you go to Walmart, you'll not find loose spice. You'll just find it in a nice bottle, and uh, those will be more likely to be marked as uh, uh, food or even seasoning. Whereas on the left, uh, if you, uh, even though it's the same thing and the ground truth is different, uh, because these models are trained with a certain type of data sets, uh, you will see this difference. So, so you can see that. Uh, uh, computer vision models, they suffer from a lot of bias. So where does all this come from? So let's look at uh, things step by step. So uh, so for the, for the uh, course, uh, what we did was we asked people to train a neural network model. And uh, typically for computer vision, we use a model called CNNs. So CNNs uh, essentially are a specific type of neural networks. You can think of them in terms of uh, these uh, special layers. Uh, which uh, are re work really well with images because images have uh, this thing called spatial correlation. So what happens is if a pixel uh, representing an eye uh, will always have some pixels that will be in certain spots with relation to other pixels. So, so to give a brief overview of uh, what neural networks are, neural networks are simply, uh, you can think of it in terms of there's a hidden layer. Hidden layer is basically a function, which a nonlinear function which takes an input and gives you an output. And then uh, the problem with NNs was that uh, because images are really uh, lar large amounts of data, for example, if you have uh, an RGB image, an image, uh, the color images that we see are basically RGB image. They have three channels. And each, uh, each uh, pixel, you can think of it in terms of, uh, of an uh, array, which uh, stores the intensity of the red color, the blue color, and the green color. So a two, uh, 200 by 200 image, that's a very small image. For example, an iPhone. And nowadays captures an image at 1920 cross one, uh, I think uh, 1080 or something like that. That's the uh, full HD image. So a, a small image like that becomes uh, 160K data points. And then if you uh, have normal network, it will take a lot of time. So uh, that's why we came up with CNNs. And essentially, CNNs uh, uh, help preserve this uh, 3D volume pro property of images. And then uh, it makes uh, deep learning scalable. So it uh, makes training with images scalable. So typically, uh, these are the different types of layers. Uh, I would not uh, go into a lot of details about what each means. But essentially, you can think here in terms of, actually, I can uh, show you. So if we uh, look at this uh, visualization, so essentially what happens is uh, this is a uh, this is a visualizer made uh, by people at Ryerson. And uh, what it essentially does is if you draw an, uh, an image here, uh, it tries to uh, use this and predict well, what kind of number it is. So you can see that in a typical CNN, there are many, many different types of layers. This is what the image looks like. And each pixel basically maps to, so these, these all these pixels map to all these uh, inner layers and then uh, again, many inner layers uh, map to the smaller layer because there's some downsampling because we want to make the uh, make the network more uh, more easily trainable, reduce the number of parameters, and so on. And then the final uh, output is softmax done over all these uh, final layers. So now, if I say, for example, uh, do this, so it becomes a nine. However, I can keep playing around with this, and you can see that. Uh, as I change the image, uh, it tries to uh, give, uh, so these are all scores. So it, uh, the, the darker the color, the more confident it is that it is that particular number. So you can see that the, uh, the more weird I make the input, uh, the more difficulty uh, it would have. So if somebody writes four weirdly, for example, if somebody writes four like this, it may still be a four, but uh, if I write four like this, which is also a four, some people may write four like that. Uh, then it will more likely be classified as nine. So again, uh, so we can see that uh, CNNs or uh, these deep learning models are not too robust. Uh, they work really well, but they also require a lot of data to train. So if, for example, in my training data, I did not have a four which looks like this, 
it is more likely to think this is a nine because of the curved nature of the uh, the top part here. Uh, so far, do you have any questions? Or do we take questions at the end? Uh, you can keep going and we'll do some uh, facilitated questions at the end as well. OK. So uh, so for the course, what we essentially asked people to uh, do in, the, in one of the tutorials was uh, we would give them a simple uh, deep learning model, and they were supposed to uh, build it to classify gender and then um, use gender as a protected attribute and classify uh, whether a person is smiling or not. So this was the model that we gave them. Uh, without going into too much details, you can think in terms of three main components. Uh, there is a feature extractor, which, uh, which given an image extracts some features. These features are sent to a deep learning black box. Uh, this black box infers what, uh, what, uh, how to associate the features with uh, uh, the output class, and then we get some output. Uh, so basically, the model gives uh, some probability about what uh, class an image uh, belongs to. So for example, uh, if an image is likely to be female, it will give a higher probability to the female class versus the male class. And uh, this, uh, uh, so we talked about CNN, they're separable cons, which are special types of CNNs. This uh, came out more recently in, I think, 2019, yeah. And uh, essentially, they, uh, they uh, reduce the number of parameters we need to use for the model. So this is not really important for the bias perspective per se, but just so that you know. Uh, and then again, there's batch norm. So these are basically the different components that go into uh, a typical deep learning model. Uh, and uh, what these essentially do is they do not uh, try to influence bias, but uh, what they do is they try to make uh, the model less sensitive to say the amount of data that you input, the number of parameters that you have, and the learning dates uh, that you collect. So, so essentially, uh, the uh, so there is another line of thought that hey, if I have a better, bigger model, shouldn't that perform better? And that's uh, that's uh, uh, if that's the case, that's something that we will figure out. So essentially, uh, if we have uh, a bigger model that might be better or not be better, uh, it depends on what kind of questions you ask it. For example, there are different kinds of models so nowadays. You can have a simple model. Uh, you can increase the number of layers in terms of making the model wider. That means that it, uh, it has more neurons uh, along one axis, or you can add more layers, or you can increase the resolution of the image uh, that goes into the model. So there are. Uh, many things we can do that, uh, there. There's also transfer learning. The idea is simply that uh, because uh, different layers of a deep learning model learn different things, what you can do is you can uh, transfer some weights from uh, one layer to the other and then uh, retrain the rest so that uh, it, uh, it uh, learns things quicker. So, uh, so uh, this is what we did. We uh, have had our simple model, recall that it had only 60K parameters. And then we used some classical papers like EfficientNet, which has about 4 million parameters. And uh, we trained uh, the image, uh, uh, we trained our data set, and we see that uh, the test accuracies don't really improve with the number of uh, parameters. So essentially, the, the idea that if you use a better model or a bigger model or a more recent model, if we will get better results is uh, completely uh, unfounded because uh, uh, given the task at hand, uh, sometimes even uh, in, in the simpler models work. So I'm not sure if you are too familiar with the machine learning jargon, but uh, one of the first things that you are, you are taught when you take a machine learning course is Occam's razor. And the idea of Occam's razor is the simplest solution is often the best solution. And uh, if you go more complicated, it usually doesn't work. Uh, another thing that we are careful, we should be careful about is uh, data management. So essentially, these are the three things that happens when we train a deep learning model. Uh, we do some data augmentations because we have limited amounts of data. So what data augmentations does is uh, it creates more training samples for, for the model to learn from. Uh, then we train, when we then we split the data into training and testing, and then we finally uh, load the uh, load the data uh, into the model. So this split also depends on how you're splitting. For example, if you have more examples of, uh, uh, say, uh, 
uh, if you're doing say gender classification with two genders, a male and female, and if, you, if the training data has more males than female, then we can end up with problems uh, uh, that we had seen with mass classification. So for example, in mass classification, if we had more examples of females uh, who had fashion accessories versus masks, then when we give a, a out of context uh, image and ask it to classify, it will just uh, classify anything that a woman wears to be a fashion accessory and everything that a man wears on his face to be a beard. So these are some of the things that even data loading can affect. So, uh, so uh, with data logs, there are some issues. For example, if you do not control the uh, the amount of data augmentation that you're doing, say if you give this image to the left and uh, we augment data, typically data augmentation either increase is photometric or geometric. In photometric, what we do is we change the, uh, uh, the uh, how the image looks, like we increase the contrast, we change the uh, channels uh, of the image or geometric, that is we crop some part of the image, we do some type of transform, like we rotate the image and so on. So for example, if I give uh, if I give this kind of a small crop and I give it a base label of uh, say male, do you, just by looking at this eye or just by looking at this half of face, can you actually tell whether this uh, is a photo belonging to uh, say a male or female? And uh, another thing uh, that people typically do while uh, they work on deep learning models is they try to search for the best parameters to give the best results. So typically, uh, if you are familiar with uh, machine learning or deep learning literature, you would see that uh, uh, they have this uh, uh, habit of cherry picking or even uh, uh, when they report results, they report it without bells and whistles. And what these bells and whistles are essentially is every model is unique. So you can basically find a perfect set of parameters uh, when, in, uh, when you give those parameters, it will uh, give you better results, but just getting better results doesn't mean that you have a better model. It just means that for those parameters and that data set, it worked best. So uh, what we need to do before we go into all these details about whether to go for a better model, whether to go for a bigger model, whether to go for uh, all these uh, hyperparameters, whether to uh, how to split the data, how to uh, whether to do data augmentations or not, we should, we have the first thing we have to understand is the data bias itself. So Typically, when you, are try, when you start off with machine learning or with any kind of task, the first thing you should do is some data analysis. And uh, the first thing uh, what we want to do in, uh, in this uh, course uh, was to check uh, what kind of, uh, uh, whether the training sample is representative or not. So when we check the whole data, we see that in terms of age, skin color, and gender, uh, the whole data had uh, splits like uh, the ones you can see on the left whereas uh, the training and testing data had way different splits. So you would see that the training data had more people with a lighter skin color and more male, whereas the test data had a equal, equalish split, uh, split in terms of gender and, uh, uh, so, and as well as in terms of uh, age. So you would see that there is already some data bias coming in the way you have split the training. Rishav froze. Let's see if he comes back in the next minute or two. Just giving Rishav a minute, I think um, he's had a tech issue. I will just ask Michael to start. Uh, okay, Rishav's back. But uh, Michael, if you could also just start getting ready, then um, we'll have you up after we do the Q&A for Rishav. All right, Rishav, you're back. We lost you for a second. Uh, you froze when we were looking at um, balancing the training and testing data sets. And okay. uh, yeah. We caught most of it, so don't worry. Oh, okay. So yeah, sorry for that. I have bad internet, it seems. Okay. So can you see my presentation? Yes, we can. Yeah, that's the okay. slide you were on. Thanks. Yeah. So essentially, uh, this was the, uh, but the problem is that the whole data set might be biased as well. So if you see, this was the split of the whole data set and you can see the whole data set kind of uh, had more examples uh, where uh, it was male and bright skin versus say female and dark skin. So uh, just by, uh, so you don't have to just uh, identify the data splits, but you should uh, also think about the make of your entire data set. 
then uh, then we go one step deeper and we uh, we have to think about okay we do get data but where does this data come from and the answer is there is probably some poor human being uh, who has to uh, label all this data set so let us uh, quickly do an exercise uh, so i'll give you this link uh, what you have to do is you have to go to this uh, website and quickly fill out the form for the uh, it will ask you for an id and for the id you can just uh, put uh, oh, how do i where is the chat option on this yeah. okay yeah so this is uh, what essentially is happening here is uh, uh, the this is something that we did for the course as well and what you would do is uh, you can skip the student id and you can quickly fill out the uh, the genders uh, in each of the uh, images as you see fit although uh, again we are keeping it uh, binary for ease of uh, uh, filling and uh, uh, this is no way represents uh, any bias in term in terms of vector or how we uh, label these images so you can uh, so i would really like everybody to quickly fill it up i'll give you about 30 seconds So while people are filling it out, can you maybe just tell us why you want this exercise? Why did we include this exercise? This is one of my favorite things that we did in the program, by the way. Uh, we are doing this exercise because uh, we want people to know uh, what kind of, uh, we want to pe put people in the, uh, in the annotator shoes. So this is essentially what happens when you are annotating. So uh, uh, usually uh, we, uh, for example, ImageNet, has uh, is a data set which has over millions of images and uh, hundreds of classes now uh, that would mean uh, millions and even a billion uh, uh, annotations right so there would be uh, it would have tens of thousands of people going in and labeling these images uh, with certain classes now if i go in and ask you hey uh, this is an image uh, what do you think is male or female and that's essentially what uh, they are doing uh, they are uh, given a set of predefined uh, responses and they have to click either A or B. They can't go and fill in a new response. So, uh, and uh, many people are unaware of uh, how difficult it is to annotate even first, annotate in the first place. And then uh, what essentially goes into the annotator's mind when they're doing this. For example, if I'm just doing this for uh, 10 cents an image, then I would rather just keep on clicking mindlessly without even thinking about any of the implications of what this label might do. So uh, this is like a very uh, short teaser, but imagine just doing this for 100, 100K images. And that sort of gives you the scale and perspective of how easy is it, it is to for unconscious bias or subconscious bias to just creep into annotations. And cultural bias as well, right? Because yeah. the annotators are coming from different places. Yeah, exactly. And that's what the next slide is. For example, if you look at a mechanical Turk and uh, the people who labeled uh, ImageNet, uh, most of them were in the US. So you would see that all the red dots are highly into the US and even Europe and very less into uh, more of Africa and India even. So you can see that since most of the images are coming from here, most of, most of the labels are coming from these, uh, uh, these developed nations, uh, you can see there have been inherent bias when they label something which looks like, for example, a spice container. Uh, so, and when we train uh, these uh, uh, train models on these images, then a spice container will always look like something you get from Walmart, not uh, something that you might fill up into like a Coke bottle, for example. Uh, so does this really mean that annotations, annotators are lazy? Uh, but it, uh, it, just, it actually means that annotations may lack context. For example, if I just do a Google search for attractive person, I would get all these images and you can see that they kind of look the same. Whereas if I uh, do an a search for attractive Indian person, it nowhere looks like anybody in uh, say normal clothes. These are, for example, most of India doesn't really wear traditional clothes all the time. But uh, when you 
uh, make their search, it will inherently try to pick up these images. And this is again a problem of context and problem of uh, what kind of data we start from. So for example, uh, we also go through this exercise live. So say we have these four images and we were asked you to again, uh, uh, give them binary gender. So uh, quickly, uh, can anyone tell me what uh, what they would uh, label these for? Uh, you can just pick male and female for now. Uh, anyone can raise their hand or uh, do that? Like just unmute and do that, I guess. So in the chat, we've got a couple of people who've said uh, female, male, male, female. So F, M, M, F. Okay. So uh, most people are agreeing on F, M, M, F. And uh, uh, that's uh, what the model would pr not predict. The model model would predict uh, female, female, male, female. Because probably because you can see Gene Simmons here has long hair and a lot of makeup. And then uh, what actually it is, is... Uh, the left is uh, Megan Rapon. She's a uh, for the soccer player, famous soccer player. Uh, second one is Gene Simmons, who is actually male. Uh, he's just wearing a lot of makeup and has long hair. But the right two are the same person wearing different clothes. Now, uh, it becomes really difficult. So as you can see, uh, if I give you, if you put you on the spot and make you label, then of course you would just, uh, there's a lot of unconscious bias that goes in here. but. Uh, and that's what creeps into the model as well. For example, the model also tries to mark the same things. And uh, so uh, these are this was the live annotation results that you got from the people. So you can see that uh, all of this, uh, uh, you can see that this is what people labeled. And uh, for example, this one, uh, let me, yeah. So if you can uh, see this, you can basically see this one is actually uh, an actor where, uh, in just a woman's garb from the movie Mrs. Doubtfire, and this is the Indian remake of the same movie uh, with uh, an, a male actor, Kamla Hassan, in, uh, in a female attire. And you can see most people actually marked uh, this one as female because they have probably not seen the movie. Uh, but this one, more people marked it as male because they probably saw the movie and they know, oh, this is just uh, Robin Williams in garb. So, and then this one, uh, uh, people, uh, mark them as male probably because they had a uh, beard uh, and uh, all of these annotators were actually students in the uh, uh, students in uh, in the course and they probably have a lot of context about uh, gender but uh, if i give this to some uh, somebody who might not have context they might still mark it as female because there are a lot of uh, those attributes as well and again uh, you can see on this one uh, this is also people were a bit confused because this is actually a trans model who uh, who poses as both. So you can see that uh, people were also confused and uh, they went tried to go more with female, but actually uh, it could be not one of those either. And then uh, the most worrisome is children. Then, for example, this is a child, and to be honest, when I picked this image, I do not remember uh, what was the the keyword search I used. But again, uh, you can see that more people try to mark uh, this person as male versus female. And uh, for kids, we don't even know uh, what, uh, 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 even uh, as humans, our annotators, we might not have that much context. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, this is so this exercise, uh, you not try to go back and think about all the options that you filled up and see uh, whether you match this or whether, uh, uh, what kind of, uh, biases uh, were there in your mind and how they are reflected in your annotations. So uh, given that we do not have ground truth, did, did you even match this? Did you even, uh, uh, and again, like this one, for example, image four was the same person, uh, uh, was this person, uh, which people again, uh, try to mark as male because it's just of how they dressed up. So you can see that uh, again, there's a lot of uh, unconscious bias that comes in. Whereas here, even though uh, the person uh, dressed up in uh, female garb, uh, you can still see uh, more people try to mark them as male. Now, 
so the the only this is not to put anybody on the spot and say hey you are biased but this is to just make you understand that there's a lot of unconscious bias cultural bias contextual bias that goes into your mind goes to your mind when you're actually annotating images and uh, uh, this is just a set of 10 images now imagine all this bias going into hundreds and thousands of images and then creeping into models so uh, so that is like uh, uh, on live annotations and this uh, I'll try to end quickly. So, uh, so for example, you can see that uh, all of these people whom, uh, how many do you think actually exist? And uh, of course, people will probably think this is a trick question because none of them do. So these are all images uh, uh, generated by uh, a GAN. And uh, this is one of the th reasons why GANs got famous was because uh, of its ability to generate images. Now, when I generate images using uh, uh, the model itself, how do I assign gender? Does the model assign gender? But uh, how does the model know? For example, here the model would not know. And the last thing that we have to be careful about uh, with uh, uh, bias and computer vision is, uh, are we looking at the right metrics? For example, if you just say accuracy, what does an accuracy mean? For example, if the model, if the data distribution itself is 80 male and 20 female, then accuracy, if you just randomly label somebody as male, uh, the, uh, uh, the accuracy of the model will still be about uh, 0.8. Similarly, if you go for another uh, type of metric called AOCROC, which is uh, alien to curve, uh, again, if you uh, try to uh, uh, fill that up, again, it will be more biased towards, uh, the model will be more biased towards uh, measuring somebody as male. So for uh, these types of problems, what you have to do is we have to create better metrics. And uh, one of the ways is we create subgroups and then we compare across subgroups. For example, we divide the data set, the test data set by skin type and gender, and then try to uh, uh, measure accuracies in these subgroups. So to conclude, uh, the, the TLDR of this whole 30-ish minute talk was uh, a data matters that you have to be really careful about uh, where data comes from even before you start training any models you don't don't even have to worry about getting the best model out there uh, from the best uh, the best paper winner but you have to actually understand how data annotations go in uh, and what are the things you can do and then you need more inclusive signals like better labels better data sets and finally you have to decide uh, on what metrics we need to optimize over so if you optimize over something like accuracy we will just create uh, a model which is biased towards uh, the data set distribution. So with that, I guess I'll conclude my talk. You'll, uh, you can find a copy. I'm not sure how, but uh, I think I can help you find a copy of these slides if you want. These are the references. And now we can go for questions. Thanks, Rashav. And um, just to emphasize as well, I mean, we're giving you a very uh, cramped version of what was done over a number of weeks. So absolutely concepts like uh, gender versus sex came up in our conversations. And it was, I would say the biggest benefit was the in-between chats and the conversations that we had after the presentations and after the different exercises, because this was an opportunity for practitioners and working professionals to grapple with these issues in a safe context of this is what we do in our job versus I'm afraid to say the wrong thing. And if I don't include one of the letters or numbers in you know, the acronym, then you know, uh, I'm gonna be vilified for, for getting it wrong. This was very, very much a safe place for practitioners to say, okay, we need to talk about this. We need to get it right. Um, what can we do differently and what's gonna work? So a decision to work with uh, binary um, classifications of gender and sex was deliberate. We wanted to keep it small so that we could manage it. Um, but as Rashav said, this it's not, it's, it's not a question of not recognizing them. It was a question of how can we manage this so that we can actually have those good conversations. Um, there is uh, a comment about assigning gender uh, on the basis of a picture is an impossible problem. But yes, when we say pre-trained, you know, like that comes from somewhere, right? Like all the data sets that we're using come from somewhere. Somebody did that job for 10 cents an image or whatever it is. So, you know, somebody did that. So if it's an impossible problem, it's, it's interesting that that's what we're doing and that's what we're using. 
Um, I've got uh, M. Singh who says there was a model that was supposed to be de uh, to detect breast cancer using mammograms, but uh, different ethnicities had different tissue concentrations, etc. Uh, but the Canadian healthcare does not collect racial data. How can we mitigate against these issues? So Rishav, I'll ask you to take that one. Um, let's say you are trying to determine something like that, but we don't have data for it. What what are some of the things that we should consider? Uh, so. The easiest answer to this is just ask them for more data and uh, hopefully they comply. But uh, in case you do not get more data, typically what we do in research is, or even in practice is we have just another model and that model is trained on some other data set which might have these attributes. And uh, we use the, uh, the predictions from that model and use that as sort of uh, a filter uh, in our newer model. So that's typically how things would go about if, if uh, you have no more data. And uh, again, we are uh, propagating two levels of bias here, but the thing is uh, without more data, there's no real nice way to go about this except, uh, ha uh, so there are actually, I can link you to a bit uh, newer research in this. And essentially what they try to do is they try to reduce bias through different models. So typically uh, if you if i train a nicer model or a, not a nicer model but more like a more unbiased model which is more cognizant of all these problems and the and i trust those predictions a bit more than um, using that model as a pre pre step where which does this classification for me in terms of gen, uh, for in terms of race and then use that racial information in my next set of uh, experiments that is something that is uh, up and coming and people are actually doing that Thanks, Rishav. I'm going to need to move on because I do want to get to the SMEs that um, uh, actually participated in the program so you can hear from people who took in some of this information and then had to go and think about how to apply them to their organizations. So I'm going to say thank you, Rishav, um, and invite Michael onto the stage. And then just one other thing that I want to mention is um, uh, I come from an interdisciplinary background. And my observation on a topic like this is that it becomes very difficult if we bring in social scientists and engineers to the table, because you have engineers who are trying to solve a model and a, a mathematical problem, really. Um, and then you have social scientists who are rightly so bringing up important themes around, um, and the example is, um, Elise, you've commented on, um, you know, biological sex versus gender. So absolutely valid perspectives. Um, but I find that a conversation can literally get stuck. The gears will come to a halt um, when you have two different audiences. So we were really trying to straddle that balance and have that balance so that we have a way forward for the engineering and AI community to be able to do things with their models um, with and skipping the step of, you're calling it the wrong thing. Um, so that was very much an emphasis. And I don't know, Michael, if uh, I'll start with, please introduce yourself, um, where you're coming from, what you're working on and what you're doing, um, and then tell us a bit about your uh, experience in the program. And if you wanna comment on any of these themes or not, entirely up to you, we're sharing experiences here. Yeah, uh, thank you. So <clears throat> can everybody see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay, great. So yeah, uh, I'm Michael. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, the work that uh, my colleagues and I did at Nokri uh, in eliminating bias in automatic speech recognition. Uh, so I want to start by just acknowledging that I'm not the only person working on this. Uh, I'm Michael. I'm a senior ML engineer at Nokri, but I also worked with some really talented colleagues. Uh, Raj Shabir, who's a machine learning engineer uh, working alongside me, uh, and Dave Mayers, who's our lead industrial organizational psychologist. Um, so basically, we work for Nokri. Uh, we're a startup, and what we do is we make a behavioral skills assessment designed to improve the diversity of organizations without impacting work performance or hiring efficiency. Um, so basically, our mission is to reduce bias in uh, hiring and in general in, uh, in promotions and, and beyond just hiring. Uh, and the way we do that is by building this assessment where we ask candidates questions like, uh, tell me about a time when you had to learn something new on the job, uh, what did you do and what was the result? Uh, and what we do is we record each candidate's answers to those questions, have those answers transcribed, uh, and then we score each of those answers on a number of criteria um, with uh, behavioral content analysis, where we, we try to understand uh, the non-technical skills of each candidate purely from the transcript itself. Now, in our case, because our entire input to our system is our transcript, it's really important that that transcript is generated through high quality and unbiased means. 
Uh, but unfortunately, automatic speech recognition is biased. Um, so not only is there prior research which exists to show this, um, but we've also been able to replicate those same results where um, testing on a number of different demographic groups, we were able to find that the majority or the, the largest amount of bias uh, exists between black and white demographic groups. Uh, now there's a lot of speculation for the reasoning behind this, and there's not a lot of conclusive evidence yet, but some speculations involve accents, background noise, and microphone quality. Um, but the bottom line is that it does exist, and we were able to replicate it using our own data set uh, on our own automatic speech recognition systems. Uh, and so what we were able to do is uh, compare basically an automatic speech recognition provider to the same transcript provided by uh, a human annotator. Uh, and by calculating the word error rate, we were able to show a pretty significant difference. So in this case, for white applicants, we're looking at a, a mean error rate of 12%, uh, whereas for black applicants, that mean error rate was 22%. Um, now, this presents a pretty significant dilemma for us um, because unfortunately, fully manual transcription, which can eliminate bias, is about 127 times more expensive. Uh, it's so expensive that it's prohibitively expensive. We can't provide a product if uh, you know, we're relying on fully manual transcription. And there's another dilemma that we have to work with, which is this equity equality dilemma, um, where you know, we strive for, for equity, but we also need to maintain equality. Um, and that's because in our industry of selection assessments, there's really strict regulation. Um, that means that your equity can't be selective. So this is a pretty standard uh, image to represent the difference between equality and equity. Um, and the hypothetical solution to the problem we have um, that I want to propose here is, you know, what if we provided um, manual transcription, so human transcription, to just the 10% of applicants that had the lowest accuracy when it came to, um, to, to the automated transcription? Um, but the problem with this is that it only benefits a select 10%. So it would be as if you know this middle child here wasn't given a box. We were only going to give the box to the smallest of children, um, which is obviously you know somewhat equitable, but that equi that that equity is not being applied equally. And so that that brought us to our main challenge, which we tried to answer uh, throughout the course of our of our experience of the vector course and and through the capstone project where uh, we wanna come up with a way to reduce or eliminate bias in automatic speech recognition that's not prohibitively expensive, does not only benefit a select portion of applicants and maintains consistent uh, scoring across all applicants. Um, now, as we learned about largely in the course, and as we've already talked about today, uh, a lot of the different approaches to reduce bias involve actually creating training objectives on the modeling side that try to neutralize bias. Um, but there's always some degree of trade-off between neutralizing bias and reducing a model's ability to predict accurately. Uh, and it also requires a lot of research background and can be complex really quickly. Uh, and the same thing can be said about um, having training data where you try to increase the representation of one demographic group versus another, particularly demographic groups that perform worse in the model. Um, and this is a great solution. However, it does require known demographics, which um, can be subverted as we just uh, recently talked about, um, but also annotation is really expensive and can take a long time. Uh, and ultimately, um, it's hard as a startup to commit to um, unproven techniques um, when we have very, very limited research or resources. Um, and so uncertainty on the research side for us is really scary. Um, and so just to add one additional challenge to our list, um, we wanted to try to solve this in a way that could be researched and implemented by a small team in a short amount of time, ideally fully researched inside the two week time frame uh, that we had for our capstone project. Um, and in the end, uh, the solution that we came up with was actually able to achieve all of our objectives. Um, and basically the way to think about it is rather than us deciding to manually transcribe uh, the 10% of applicants that had the worst accuracies. Um, we chose to manually transcribe the 10% of words that had the lowest accuracy across all applicants. And so in practice, the way we were able to achieve this is by uh, identifying where in a transcript there was a high concentration of low accuracy words, taking those audio snippets and sending them out for manual transcription, and then taking the results of those manual trans transcriptions on those small snippets 
and seamlessly merging the two sets of transcripts back together to produce one final result. Uh, and this solution, we were able to not only complete a proof of concept in the 40 hours of work for the vector, vector capstone, um, but we've also been working on productionizing this system, uh, taking an additional couple hundred hours, which is now uh, where we're at today, uh, to do all of our API integration, scheduling, and so on. Um, and so I, I point on this specific, or I, I focus on this specific point only to show that we were able to find a solution that had very low research time, and most of the time really just went into implementation, which holds a lot less uncertainty than, than the research did. Now, in practice, this is kind of what that looked like. And there's a reason I'm going into a, a little bit more detail here, which I'll get to in a second. Uh, but basically, what you're looking at here is three transcripts, uh, three different applicants and their, their results. Um, on the x-axis, we have time. And on the y-axis, we have confidence. Um, and so basically, over the course of each of these applicants' transcripts, we can see in gray, each word is um, it, it ha has been given a prediction from our automated speech recognition model of how confident the model was on predicting that given word. And we were, we were able to take that raw signal here, filter it, which is the signal in green, and then apply a threshold so that whenever that word level confidence dropped below a given threshold, we would send that patch out for manual review. And so you can see in the first case, um, you know, this entire patch, this patch, this patch, there's four different sections that were sent out for manual review, the majority of the transcript. And you can see that the majority of errors in transcription actually did occur in those regions of time. Um, in the second, we can see that not all applicants receive this benefit. An applicant that has uh, really high confidence in all of their words doesn't need as much manual transcription. Uh, but somebody that only has a few sections, a couple small sections, still receives uh, benefit from this type of a system. Uh, you can see covering over these, these significant error ranges. Uh, but there's still a couple knobs that we needed to tweak and settle in on, even after we came up with a solution uh, that did work. Um, and the first knob that we still needed to tweak was what percentage of time are we going to send out for manual review? Because as I showed earlier, you know, manual review costs 127 times more. So it's important to keep this number as small as possible. And so looking at the trade-off, the cost benefit trade-off here, we can see what happens in our research uh, when we increase the percentage of time that was sent out for manual transcription. And we were able to show and prove that by increasing the manual transcription amount, we actually reached a crossover point where the word level accuracy for our demographic groups actually flipped. Um, and that was really, really interesting to see. It showed us that, that this technique holds a lot of merit in being able to, uh, to mitigate the kinds of biases we see in ASR. Um, but there's one other knob that we can tweak, and that's how aggressively we end up filtering our signal. Um, and uh, this is really important to point out, um, because as you can see here, you know, we have different signals um, with different degrees of filtering. And in purple here, we have a signal which has been really heavily filtered. But we can imagine about what happens when we actually set our filter width to be infinite, right? If we set an infinite filter width, we actually end up with just um, for all of the course of each applicant's response, we're basically determining what is the average confidence for the given applicant, and then determining whether or not we send out the entire transcript for review or not, which sounds really, really similar, if not identical, to the hypothetical situation I proposed earlier. Um, so the reason I point this out is that there are these two kinds of trade-offs now, these two business trade-offs, where even though we've come up with a technical solution that ultimately solves the bias problem, there are still trade-offs to be made. Uh, and so these two knobs that now our business has control over are, you know, what percentage of the time is sent out for manual transcription? Because as we showed, you know, we can send out more, it's just going to cost more. Uh, and number two is how much do we filter the word level confidence, which changes this equity versus equality trade-off. And so I bring this up to show that, you know, in our case, while we were able to come up with a technology that provides a means to change, just having the technology alone isn't always a reason to change. Um, and in our case, you know, business strategy is ultimately really important and it needs to align with whatever technology or whatever project you end up working on relating to bias and the trade-offs that come about with it. And so for us working at Nokri, you know, we're really 
we're really privileged to, to have such an important mission of decreasing bias and to have a market segment that, um, that has these needs and that are aligned with the needs of reducing bias. Um, but without strong incentives like this, um, most of our competitors, most of the other companies in the industry are likely not going to follow. Uh, and so it's important to recognize from this, from our experiences, that technology alone can't always solve these systemic problems. Because unfortunately, in the business world and not in the research world, we also have to consider how you know, the, the, the technology aligns with, with the business strategy. Um, and so yeah, there's, there's a, a lot that I can go into of the next steps of the research that we're doing. Uh, but maybe in the interest of time, I'll, I'll uh, punt it. And uh, if anybody would like to know more, uh, feel free to reach out and uh, always happy to chat. So thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. That's really fantastic. Um, I don't have any notes in the chat um, and I will move on uh, to the second company. Um, but actually just the one point that I do wanna make is, um, you know, Michael, you, uh, firstly, your team was incredible. You guys were fantastic in the program, really forthcoming and, you know, really willing to roll up your sleeves and get involved and understand and fix things. Um, what I loved as well was that you represented industry in the sense the trade-offs are real, right? So you can't send everything um, uh, for secondary examination because it costs money. Um, so I think maybe that's one of the biggest takeaways was these things are not happening in isolation in a lab. Um, the, sometimes the reason that we have bias in industry is just because the trade-offs are real and business leaders are not as courageous as you guys have been to try and understand them. So. Um, that's just me saying nice things about you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, and uh, I'm going to ask Bart to come on stage and uh, tell us about your organization and your experience in the program and what you were able to accomplish, etc. So, Bart. Yep. There you are. Everyone. Hi. Uh, sorry about that. Um... Let me just, can you see my screen? Not yet, right now we can just see your face. Okay. Now we see, nope, that was not the oh. correct screen. Sorry. Um, no problem. There yes. we go. Um, <laughs> can you see the presentation slides? Yes. All right, perfect, sorry about that. Um, Thanks very much for the introductions and for the time uh, uh, being able to let me to speak with uh, to the group here. Uh, my name is Bart Kaderovic and I'm a research um, a senior research scientist at Wonder AI. And uh, this is a, a course that we took with uh, my um, colleagues, Thomas Toka and Mina Soltagis. And uh, what I wanted to kind of go over is um, uh, kind of how we handle bias and what we do, how we handle bias and how that related back to uh, the course. Um, so Wonder AI, uh, we very much, it's in, actually in our tagline, we research the dynamics of value creation and biases in the art world. So bias is a really big component of what we do. And it's mostly because uh, the art market is a very social system. Um, so we listen to um, any kind of signal that we can get around um, the art market, the artists, uh, the curators, um, any stakeholders uh, that we uh, find relevant. Uh, so we actually have millions of these uh, facts uh, that come in in real time. We source 50,000 different sources uh, for this information. And we focus on um, uh, the post-war and contemporary artists, uh, which um, we think we have about 95% coverage of. Um, and what we're trying to do is uh, come up with new knowledge that uh, really help decision makers to understand the art market um, to understand the, how artists grow, where value comes from, how to track different artists, um, how to measure uh, past influences, past and future influences of different museums and galleries, um, either whether that's uh, uh, locally or globally. And uh, we really try to track as much of this information as we can uh, and go beyond the kind of um, analytics that people use uh, based on auction data. I really try to understand where value actually is coming from within the art market. Is it from the artists themselves? Is it from the society that they try to um, represent and, uh, and so on? 
so as you can see, there's a lot of uh, room here for biased information. Um, so I wanted to sort of cover where biases do exist in the art market. Um, so the art market is uh, heavily contextualized in social norms. Um, these biases that uh, do exist uh, really in, uh, influence the way uh, talent is perceived. Uh, and that um, then uh, determines how people value different uh, artworks and different artists. Um, so to, uh, to sort of combat bias, uh, it really requires a lot of active uh, control. Uh, so that means employment of fairness constraints, uh, avoiding uh, magnifying bias or removing source of bias, um, and rather than uh, kind of removing data, really try to neutralize it. And um, uh, to try to understand how well our models are performing, uh, we have to look at the predictions that they make um, uh, compared to objective evaluators. Uh, so these are usually um, appraisers rather than looking at critics or social media or the buying public. So we really try to make it as objective as possible. Uh, just to kind of give you an idea of what the art market and the biases that exist, uh, we focused on for this project, uh, and I'll focus on this uh, bias in this presentation, on gender bias. Um, so here on the right hand side, you have um, uh, sort of uh, a snapshot of how many artists uh, exist in the world and what percentage of that is the is female artist. And so you see here on the left hand side on the y axis are different countries and these are just the top 30 uh, countries with the top most artists and on the y on the x axis you have the percentage of female artists. Um, so you can see that Finland has the highest uh, percentage of female artists uh, at around 40 uh, 47%. Uh, Canada comes in at number five with around 42. And you can see that that 40% uh, percent, um, uh, line down the middle, everyone really falls below that. So the, the average number of uh, artists, uh, female artists uh, in each individual country is around 30 to 35%. And uh, so you can see that this really is uh, another representation of female artists, especially since uh, the number of artists that actually um, finish school and go into the art market as professional artists is around 50-50 between male and female. Um, and uh, this is something that we've seen before. Um, I'm sure everyone is familiar with the, um, the, the percent of uh, professional, uh, uh, profession, female professionals in the STEM fields uh, relative to how many actually graduate. So here you see in computer science, um, the male counterparts um, tend to go into computer jobs, uh, managers, um, whereas um, the female uh, graduates tend to go into teaching and a lesser um, percentage going into uh, actual uh, programming uh, jobs. And this is also reflected in the, uh, the salaries uh, that uh, are associated with these, uh, these jobs. So here you see um, that the uh, male uh, generally have higher paid uh, positions uh, compared to their um, female counterparts. And that actually, you can see this across different STEM fields and the same kind of um, uh, phenomenon occurs in the art market. And so here is um, same kind of graph for fine arts and music um, graduates. As you can see that there's, there's a bit more uh, female graduates um, but most of those graduates actually become teachers, uh, either maybe or a smaller amount of going to secretaries and a small amount go into actually being designers and artists. And on the, on the male side, on the left hand side, you see that uh, there are some, uh, many of them go into teaching, but uh, many of them also go into being designers, musicians, and so on. So there's a, there's a bit of a discrepancy here, like we saw in, in computer science graph. Uh, and this is also reflected in the field uh, in, in terms of uh, how much they're paid. Uh, so you can see here that there's a greater number of um, uh, male uh, professionals uh, with uh, fine arts degrees and they make more money on the right-hand side versus uh, the, uh, the higher amounts on the left-hand side for female, which is in the lower, uh, lower percentages. Okay. So you can see that there's the, you know, that, that kind of similarity also that we know about STEM also happens in, in the art and fine arts. Um, so why is, why is this important? Um, so having a fine arts degree uh, does not guarantee success, um, but it does uh, correlate with earlier success in the art market. Um, 
So after uh, uh, the first initial years, um, the artist success really starts depending not so much on their education, but you know, the quality of work, the exposure, uh, prestige of institutions, and continued work. So if there's any gaps in the, um, the time that an artist produces work, uh, that actually affects them negatively. And you can just imagine that uh, many times uh, women will come out of the workforce to start a family and they, they will be negatively impacted by this, um, this kind of phenomenon. Um, so what we observe in the art market is that the, the, the length of female careers is actually shorter than the male counterparts, right? So they leave the profession much earlier than uh, male artists. And this, this uh, lack of continuity between years is much more frequent in female artists. Um, there's also uh, this institutional bias. So we wanted to understand uh, fairness uh, relative to uh, not so much the institution, but to the environment that that institution is in. So what we found was that gender is uh, bias relative to um, the pool of uh, available artists. So we actually broke down in our analysis uh, artists uh, based on uh, how many artists are available in a particular city, in a particular country, and in the world. And so uh, what we tried to capture here is the fact that if an institution has 20% uh, female artists, it's not necessarily that they're biased, it's just that it might be the case that only 20% of the available artists are uh, female. And so we, we kind of said that, okay, if that's the case, then maybe they're not biased. Um, they're just sort of, you know, sampling uh, randomly from, uh, from the pool of artists that they have available. Um, and so we actually looked into this a bit more and we actually saw that um, it was actually the fact that uh, institutions preferred male artists relative to the available pool. So institutions themselves were actually quite biased. And the only time where that wasn't the case is for institutions that focus specifically on female artists or they focused on um, a medium of art that was uh, related or more traditionally done by female uh, artists. Um, next, we wanted to see if the institutions themselves, if they have more clout or more acclaim, if they're able to uh, promote uh, gender equality. And so based on their data, we found that, no, this isn't the case. Um, institutions, uh, uh, Look at uh, look at the, the entire market, see what's available, and then pick out the most uh, prominent artists, which tend to be uh, male. And so this is uh, the the ratio of male to female is around three to one. Okay. Um, so now I wanted to discuss the the actual uh, project that we uh, did. Um, so the motivation here was the evaluation of press releases for. Uh, art exhibits, and we wanted to see if we can identify bias within the description of the exhibits. Now, these exhibits are usually very complementary. They're meant to describe and promote the artist. So we weren't sure if we would find any, any actual uh, bias, as it, it, it's very much supposed to be a positive um, uh, description of the artist. And so we, uh, our approach was to look at the, the text and evaluate any um, sentiment to see if we can find uh, certain words that are used uh, with negative or positive sentiment for different genders, um, what the distribution is uh, of these uh, words and so on. Um, so what we did is we took uh, 22,000 press releases from 2015 to 2019. Uh, there was uh, around 8,600 8, unique English texts. There was around 4,000 female and 7,000 male artists. And this is uh, taken from around the world. And uh, we went through several iterations of this, uh, this analysis. So we pulled out um, the words that were most, co most common uh, using TFIDF. Um, we identified um, which are the most positive, which are the most negative words using uh, the AFN uh, library. And we assigned um, uh, an offense score to every uh, sentence and every uh, word that we found in the press releases. And as you can imagine, what we found was that the most positive words were the, are, are associated with um, male uh, related text. And the most negative words were um, more frequent with female related text. So on the left-hand side, you see in the orange is the number of um, uh, texts with, uh, for male artists. 
uh, with uh, positive words. And you can see that uh, some of these are high, uh, more skewed towards uh, male artists. On the right hand side, you see uh, negative words and you see that uh, the main discrepancies are that the uh, female artists have higher, um, higher counts of these uh, negative, most negative words. Um, we also wanted to see how these words are distributed or what percentage of um, uh, extremely negative and extremely positive words um, uh, were uh, associated with female and male artists. And here you see that, uh, again, in the blue, the extremely negative words were higher uh, in female artists and the uh, extremely positive and very positive words were more uh, found in the male artists. Um, so next, what we did is we took uh, these press releases and we trained a GPT-2 gener uh, gen text generator uh, to see if we can um, uh, remove the bias or um, uh, well, we would to see what would happen. And so what ended up happening, it, it actually um, enhanced the bias that, uh, that was in the text. So on the left-hand side, you see most positive words. There's many more um, male bars, uh, the, the orange ones versus the female ones, which are in the blue. And the negative words were also increased for female artists, right? So you can see that the GP2 generated text really um, enhanced any biases that were in the text originally. Um, and we saw the same thing when looking at the dis distribution of very negative and very po and ex uh, extremely positive uh, words, where uh, more of the very uh, negative words were um, increased uh, for female artists and uh, the more positive words were increased for male artists. So the GP2 generated text really enhanced these, these biases. So um, to uh, mitigate this, we sort of took two approaches. Uh, the first was elimination strategy, which we would just remove words, uh, the, all the negative words and see how that looks. And the second one was substituting words uh, for with neutral counterparts. And so what we found here is that the elimination strategy did remove a lot of the, um, the negative words. And so we saw uh, many more positive words on the left-hand side and very few negative words. Um, but at the same time, you can still see that many of the negative words are really highly associated with uh, female artists. For the substitution strategy is a much more interesting result uh, in that it didn't reduce the number of words, uh, it just neutralized them. And so it sort of evened out the, the number of positive and the number of negative words found for each gender. So we found the substitution strategy was a bit more successful. Um, just for the sake of time, I won't go into details, but we sort of did some um, Hypothesis testing, we did find that there was less bias from the GP2 uh, trained uh, text and based on elimination and substitution. And um, I guess in conclusion, um, bias exists in the art market. Um, it exists in the actual um, selection of artists uh, from it by institutions as I was describing in the beginning, but it even exists in the promotional material that uh, is uh, used to uh, promote uh, different artists, right? So you would assume that positive text would be used, but actually uh, bias actually creeps in into these uh, uh, into this, this text as well. Okay. Uh, thanks very much, and that's it for me. Thank you so much, Bart. All right, well, we are at 5 p.m., um, but really uh, thank you for taking the time to share that with us. And um, I think one of the, the biggest uh, takeaways from your project and your work was it's in the art world, right? So just, just when we thought we're only dealing with, I don't know, recruitment type of issues or other computer vision type of issues, um, really this is a cross domain and looking at the approach that you took to really just go and find it. I think you guys had to do quite a bit of digging initially. Um, it wasn't obvious exactly where you would find the bias and you were actually able to come up with some, uh, some results to show that there was bias in your field, which is pretty incredible. Um, Bart, thank you so much. Um, I do thank see you. one comment in there and it's a thank you, which is good because we need to wrap up. Uh, thank you everybody for attending the session. Um, education is the key. So nobody has the right answers and even the SMEs that you saw here today, it's a work in progress, everybody's working towards reducing bias. And one of the first things that we can do is what you've all done here today is educate ourselves so that we can be empowered to, to do that. 
So thank you again to MLOps, uh, to Dave and the team, uh, Jen, uh, who I don't think is here. Uh, Faraz, thank you so much for uh, uh, helping us facilitate this great conversation. Stay in touch, folks. Uh, find us on the socials. And uh, we look forward to catching up with you again soon. If you do any interesting work in BIAS, let us know as well, just so we can share that and disseminate it. And uh, perhaps we'll see you at the next conference. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Have an incredible rest of your day. And um, yeah, we appreciate you being here. You're very welcome. I've got some thank yous in the chat. Thank you very much, everybody. See you soon. <laughs>